It is the contemporary Baku, a town which strives to dazzle with its fictitious luxury and shine. Today, even the smallest recollection of those who used to live here as founders of the town and who left an indelible trace on its image is being furiously avoided. The memory is lost of representatives of the nation which became one of the co-founders of the Azerbaijani Soviet Republic. The present rulers of Azerbaijan have made anti-Armenianism a state policy, aspiring to eliminate the memory of the Armenians of Baku and the horrible crime which was committed here in January 1990. And not many can believe today that this town, only some 20 years ago, was drowned in blood and a bacchanalia of medieval cruelty and vandalism was being performed in the streets. Just 20 years ago. It is really hard to tell what was happening those days in Baku. It is dangerous for the psychological state of a normal human, one used to considering categories of humane and civilized relations between people. In our mercy to the audience, we shall not bring the footage of the most vicious massacres. The main goal of this documentary is to present the truth of the events in Baku in January 1990. We are not pursuing the goal of inflaming the feelings of hatred and enmity, but simply to remain on the pitch displayed by the Armenian people during this and all other ferocious massacres of the Armenians in Azerbaijan. On January 13th, 1990, after 5 p.m., a crowd of some 50,000 people who were leaving from a demonstration at the Lenin Square, splitting into groups, committed pogroms, destruction, arson, violence, and murders. Isvestia newspaper, January 15th, 1990. A huge mob yelling the slogans, Glory to the heroes of Sumgait, Viva Baku without Armenians, gathered at a meeting in Lenin Square. At nightfall, pogroms began. They were committed with inconceivable savageness and sadism. The area around the Armenian district became an arena of mass killings. People were thrown out of balconies of upper stories. The crowds were attacking the Armenians, beating them to death. Slogans to oust Armenians out of Baku were voiced during the demonstrations. Anti-Armenian slogans were heard from the crowd, and it was after this that the most horrible events happened. The correspondent of Moscow Radio was reporting. Many pogroms were committed with a special cruelty. On January 14th, a group of 30 to 40 people stormed into the flat of the Torosians, an elderly couple, where they found two other elderly relatives of the family. The criminals beat them all, grabbed 3,500 rubles, and forced these Armenians and their neighbors out of the town, threw oil on them and burned them says Kirill Stalyarov in his book, Breakup. On January 15th, Radio Liberty reported, raging crowds killed at least 25 people on the night of the 14th in the Armenian district of Baku. According to preliminary information, the death toll has reached 25. On January 15th, the pogroms and violence in Baku continue. The death toll of the clashes over the last three days reaches 33, according to preliminary data. However, this number cannot be considered final, as not all the flats in Baku where the pogrom makers had been to are counted. Isvestia newspaper, 16 January 1990. Lenin Street, one of the central streets in Baku, was flooded with blood. 
A Russian living in the Azerbaijani capital recalled with horror the scenes of atrocities against their neighbors, who were fired at point blank, thrown out of balconies, burned alive, or dismembered by raging crowds of Azeris. Those are most remorseless murders. They were attacking men and women, young and elderly, simply because they were Armenians. Being an Armenian in Azerbaijan meant to be sentenced to death, the Radio Liberty correspondent reported. On January 16th, 64 cases of pogroms in flats were identified when Armenians became the victims. In the Lenin district of the capital, four burnt unidentified bodies were found. Isvestia newspaper, January 18, 1990. On January 17th, 45 pogroms and arsons of residential houses in Baku were committed. Isvestia newspaper, January 19, 1990. On January 18th, Russian poet David Samoylov made a note in his notebook. The atrocities in Azerbaijan are shocking. My thoughts are only about this. The unprecedented sadism of Azeris and inactivity of law enforcement bodies was testified to by even one of the leaders of the People's Front, Azerbaijan, Etibar Mamadov. I myself witnessed the murder of two Armenians near the railway station. A crowd gathered, threw petrol on them, and burned them. Whereas the regional militia division was only 200 meters away with some 400 to 500 soldiers of the internal forces. The soldiers passed by the burning bodies at a distance of some 20 meters and nobody attempted to circle the area and disperse the crowd. Novaya Zhin newspaper, 1990, number five. From TASS reports, on January 19th, unrest and pogroms were going on, which resulted in casualties. The number of Armenians killed in Baku last week has already surpassed that of the victims of Sumgait. This new tragedy is the direct consequence of the authorities' attempt to silence the first one. From an article, Burning January, by Andrei Pralnikov, Moscow News, January 21st, 1990. Those days, the genetic memory of Armenians insistently testified. This is the same genocide, the same mode, the same butchers. The Armenian Tatar clashes of the beginning of the century, which covered nearly all the towns of the South Caucasus, became a new link of the bloody chain which has spread up to the present days, receiving continuation already in the most recent history, when new mass killings and pogroms of Armenians were organized on the grounds of the anti-Armenian movement, including those in Baku. What is the ideological basis of those actions? Pogroms that were initiated by the Tatar side received a clear impulse from Constantinople. The political power that was just taking shape received a clear message from the Young Turks with an emphasis on the following. All the efforts should be focused on neutralizing the Armenian factor. Armenians have to become our enemies. In essence, the link between Anatolian Turks and Caucasian Tatars was signed and sealed with Armenian blood. The first outcome of this link became the Armenian Genocide of 1905, then the genocide of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire followed with culmination in 1915, and all this was crowned by pogroms of Armenians in 1918 in Baku, implemented jointly by squads of Tatar Musavatists and divisions of the Turkish army. In 1905-1906, the first mass pogroms of Armenians were committed, which were named an outrageous tragedy by the Catholicos of all Armenians Mugurdich I, Hrimian Hayrik. 1918, 
Out of 88,673 Armenians living in Baku, 52,822 suffered, or 59.57% of the total number. Among them, killed, 5,248, refugees, 31,293, prisoners, 3,396, lost, 3,572. The coast became the witness of heartbreaking scenes. Huge crowds of those who were hoping to flee and the lack of boats created that relentless confusion. Family members are losing each other. Parents are losing their children, brothers, their sisters, spouses, each other. One is leaving while the other is staying due to the lack of available seats. Bakshi Ishkanyan wrote in his book, The Great Horrors in Baku. This scene will replicate in the port of Baku 72 years later, in the same place, with the same cruelty, with the same goals. The genocide of Armenians in Azerbaijan continued up to 1923, with its peak of atrocities in March of 1920, in Shushi, where 20,000 people became victims of merciless massacre. Later, due to the violence guised by the false Soviet internationalism, as well as terror and persecutions, Hundreds of thousands of Armenians had to flee from their place of origin. In response to the obvious white genocide, the self-determined Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh rose to protect their rights in a rightful and peaceful way. On February 20th, 1988, the session of the Nagorno-Karabakh Regional Council of People's Deputies made a decision to apply to the Supreme Councils of the Azerbaijani SSR and Armenian SSR with the request to transfer the Autonomous Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh from Azerbaijan's constitution into that of Armenia. The pogroms of Armenians in Sungait became the response to this constitutional demand of the Armenians of Karabakh. Those pogroms identified the originally existing civilizational watershed between the Armenians and the nationalist fanatics who had lost their human identity. The ferocious pogroms of Armenians in Sungait become a prelude to the bloody anti-Armenian bacchanalia which spread all over Azerbaijan in 1988 to 1992. Sungait, February 1988. Dozens of killed, burned alive, tortured, wounded, 18,000 exiled. May 1988. The entire Armenian population of Shushi is forcefully deported. Summer, fall, 1988. Thousands of civilians forcefully deported from the Armenian villages of the northern part of Nagorno-Karabakh. November, December, 1988. A wave of pogroms and deportation of Armenians is all over Azerbaijan. In November, 1988, Armenia was already flooded by hundreds and thousands of people fleeing from a savage massacre of Armenians in Baku and other areas of Azerbaijan. The bell rang on November 21st, 27th. Events in Kerovabad, Armenian Gansak. According to incomplete information, 
After seven days in the town, 18 were killed, 60 lost, 74 seriously wounded. It was only due to the self-defense organized by the Armenians that large-scale pogroms and killings were prevented. 45,000 Armenians were exiled from the town. In 1989, the economic blockade of Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh began. The bandit attacks and pogroms on the roads, relentless murders of civilians, the forceful deportation of residents of Armenian villages, kidnappings, tortures, humiliation, and beatings all took place. In Baku itself, the situation was deteriorating day by day. Armenians were largely fired from work. They were insulted and humiliated in the offices, public transport, shops, and public offices where they applied to receive documents. Due to the implementation of ethnic cleansing from 1988 to 1992, over 500,000 Armenians were forcefully deported from Azerbaijan. Only within one year preceding the January genocide of Armenians in Baku, over 60 citizens of Armenian origin were inconspicuously killed in their homes, at work, and in the streets. Hundreds of Armenians were crippled, dozens of thousands exiled. From an article, Black Cold January, in the newspaper, Ofto, January 22nd to 28, 1991. Here are just some of the examples of what was happening that month. December 1st, the 60-year-old Armenian Gosparov was tortured to death. The same day, another Armenian was murdered. His name was not identified. Armenian graves were desecrated, gravestones destroyed. December 10th, Suren Krikorian was killed at his house after the most cruel tortures. December 16th, two Armenians were captured on subway station April 28th. One was beaten to death, the other managed to escape. December 26th, the Armenian church on the Fountain Square was set on fire. On December 31, the state borders between the Nakhichevan Autonomous Republic and Iran all along the Arox River were completely destroyed. Less than two weeks remained until the final act of Armenian pogroms in Baku. By January 1990, only 35,000 Armenians out of 230,000 remained in Baku. Those were mostly elderly and sick people, as well as their relatives who stayed to care for them. In the meantime, the targeted anti-Armenian psychosis was deepening in the town. Multi-thousand demonstrations of the People's Front were underway, with the main slogans reading, Death to Armenians. On January 10, 1990, a state of emergency was announced, but not in Baku, in the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Republic and some other areas where peaceful demonstrations were organized with demands to stop the violence against Armenians. The policy of state terrorism against peaceful citizens of Armenian nationality was coming to its logical end. On January 12, 
the representatives of the radical wing of the People's Front of Azerbaijan, Neymat Panakhov and Ragin Gaziev, announced during a broadcast of Baku TV that the town is full of homeless people, whereas thousands of Armenians are still living in comfort. And immediately, 5,000 demonstrators spread over the town with addresses of Armenian flats in their hands. Minister for the Interior Vadim Bakatin will say two months later at a session of the Supreme Council of the USSR. Ну, десятки трупов валяли в нашем блоке, вот так. Она говорит, когда я эту картину увидела, все в крови наша ну, улица, была, она скорее хотела а домой. Прибежала, увидела, что в лифте валяется там мой муж весь в крови, и она упала в обморок. Ирина Мосасова, the author of Armenians of Baku, Existence and Exodus describes a clear mechanism of preparation and implementation of pogroms. Drafting of a detailed map of the town with sites inhabited by the remaining Armenians marked on the map. Large-scale offensive anti-Armenian campaign in the media started by a significant part of the Azerbaijani intelligentsia. Assaults, beatings and killings of individuals of Armenian origin in the streets of the town and in public transport. Coordination of activities of employees of the condominiums with militia and ambulance crews in the course of the forthcoming pogroms, which in essence was nothing other than sabotage. The Russian citizens of Baku, who fled from the town after January 1990, testified. When the pogroms began, the extremists had exact addresses of where the Armenians lived, Russians, mixed families. But the pogrom makers not only had the addresses, they had the map of Baku where areas populated by Armenians were marked by crosses, a direct target for murders and violence. And it was exactly those days when the first secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Azerbaijan, Abdul Rahman Vezirov, made a speech on TV, which was full of hysteric, anti-Armenian rhetoric. That was the call to start violence, and the vandals began acting. They started to do what was first heard on July 18, 1988, by Mikhail Gorbachev, who asked a question to the parliament members from Armenia. Have you considered what might happen to the 200,000 Armenian population of Baku? General Alexander Lebed in his book, My Life and My Country, wrote, They were catching and beating to death the Armenians, and at the same time, the Jews, Ossetians, Georgians, and all others who resembled Armenians to a greater or lesser extent. They were beating in the face, not in the passport. In the course of Armenian pogroms in Baku, the raging crowd literally tore a man apart and his remains were thrown into a garbage bin from an article in Soyuz Weekly, May 19, 1990. The group commander, Azeri by origin, goes out to the town on assignment. Upon returning, he immediately asks for vodka. He is furious. He had seen how a woman was thrown out of the window from a balcony of a multi-storied building, naked, into a fire of burning furniture, and then, a militant from the People's Front of Azerbaijan was waving that woman's ear from the balcony, testified Soviet Army officer Alexei Vasilyev. Evgeny Primakov announced at the closed session of the Supreme Council of the USSR on March 5, 1990. We witnessed how in the situation, when the wild anti-Armenian pogroms brought about numerous human casualties, in number days, dozens of thousands of Armenians lost their houses and were deported from the country. 
бы это поверить. Вот моя мама, я ей говорю, мама, ну почему ты вещи хотя бы платил, что-нибудь вынесла бы из квартиры, вот ценное что-то вынесла бы из квартиры, соседи бы спят, хотя бы у русских, вы понимаете? Говорит, ну как я могла поверить, что в наше время кто-то мог квартиры ворваться, ворваться понимаете? Но демонстрация лада, ну кто мог, мы ну, никто не верил в это, что кто-то может ворваться в квартиру, убивать, грабить. Но ну, никто в это не верил, вы понимаете? Ты меня изгнали с работы, изгнали из дома. И сейчас мы оказались в Белинтине, в жутком положении, без двора, без стола, как говорится, без имущества. Все, что, все, что у меня осталось от моего дома, вот, все мое состояние. Это все, что у нас осталось. The Armenians of Baku, who fully drank the cup of woe, had only one wish, to escape from the town which had turned into a hell on earth. Those who escaped by some miracle were sent to the port, to be boarded on ferries sailing to the Turkmen SSR via the Caspian Sea. In the port, the refugees were searched, their last possessions were taken from them, they were beaten again and humiliated in public, after which they were shoved onto the ferry. Ну, это случайно, буквально случайно мы попали на паром, потому что мы вызвали три наряда милиции, и милиция, которая, в общем-то, и начала грабить нашу квартиру, вывезли нас на паром. Там на пароме, вот, команда парома, несмотря на то, что было два представителя власти, напали на мужа, избили, и сына, и мужа хотели бросить в море. From an article in Krasnovodsky Mayak newspaper, January 15th, the ferry is approaching the quay in Krasnovodsk. Fatigued, exhausted people are walking down the ladder. Volunteers, young guys from Krasnovodsk, are helping the feeble elderly, bringing them down in their arms. January 19th, Chief of City Division of the Interior of Krasnovodsk, Major Karamzin, told, Four days passed since January 15th, but the picture has not changed. Two refugees, a man and a woman around 85 to 90 years old, died on the boat of wounds and beatings during the voyage. Secretary of Krasnovots City Committee of the party Muravyova told, we have already accepted over 10,000 refugees, a terrible picture. The people of Turkmenistan behave those days generously and mercifully displaying sincere compassion towards Armenians who found themselves in a great disaster. Yerevan accepted the first refugees on the night of 1415 January, when the first airplane landed. In just one day, 18 planes arrived. All the newcomers had to be placed somewhere. They needed food, heat, and treatment, physical and psychological. Once the ferry in Krasnovost was set on function, they poured into Moscow in the thousands, filling the railway station and airports. The elderly women, on whose hands the racist extinguished cigarettes, half-dressed children in home-style slippers, men and women with their eyes dim from grief. We have seen Armenians whose only fault was that they were born Armenians, and Azerbaijanis who were exiled only because their father, mother, husband or wife were of a different nationality. From an article, Penetrating Wound, by Anatoly Golovkov, Agonyok Weekly, number 6, 1990. hospital. И потом мне позвонили, сказали, что соседи Гватела, уже твоего дома нету, уже ограбили 40 человек, ломали твои все, что было. Выгнали из Баку, и мой дом зажгли до тла. Это сволочи, это лази люди. Мой дом зажечь, на что азербайджанцы, мои дети там остались. Разве это будем? Где это написано? Свой мусульманский народ они уже живут и бьют. In the following two months in Yerevan hospitals, 32 refugees died of wounds and injuries. Thus, the mournful list, which counted around 300 people, was increased. The number of refugees who died in the hospitals of other towns remained unknown. From TASS reports of January 22, 1990, 
Over 30,000 people, members of families of servicemen of the Soviet Army and Navy, were evacuated from Azerbaijan. According to the publication in the Military Historic Magazine in July 1990, 30 Army servicemen died in Baku over January-February 1990. Many Soviet soldiers and officers, acting without order, guided by their own conscience, rescued Armenians, helping them break away from the hell. And it was that time when the country's leaders in the Kremlin were trying to make a decision to bring or not to bring the troops into the town. Until January 19th, Gorbachev and the Kremlin did not interfere in the situation, despite an adequate military garrison being located in Baku, just like the internal forces, which were able to take control of the situation over a short period of time. Unlike Sumgait, the Soviet army was late in Baku, not by three hours, but a whole week. Moreover, to stop the pogroms, it was enough to let in the forces of the Baku army garrison and the internal troops. The troops entered the town, seized with pogroms, not to stop them, but to prevent the final seizure of power by the People's Front of Azerbaijan, which was planned for January 20th. From an article in Moscow News, February 4th, 1990. The troops entered the town, seized with pogroms, not to stop them, but to prevent the final seizure of power by the People's Front of Azerbaijan, from an article in Sabsetnik Weekly. But why, then, were the Armenian pogroms allowed? Why did those pogroms, which were committed with silent approval of the authorities, become the reason to engage troops? On January 20th, the Soviet troops finally entered the town. They entered when the Armenians were entirely expelled from Baku. On February 13th, 1990, the Supreme Council of the Armenian SSR made a decision to condemn the pogroms in Baku and other areas of the Azerbaijani SSR, acknowledging them as the continuation of genocide towards Armenians, as well as demanded from the Supreme Council of the USSR to acknowledge and condemn the genocide of Armenians in Baku and other populated areas of the Azerbaijani SSR in January 1990. The UN Convention on Prevention and Punishment for the Crime of Genocide states, In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. A. Killing members of the group. B. Causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. C. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. The bloody week in Baku remained largely unrecognized by the Soviet people. The events in Baku were covered very poorly and in a biased manner. The foreign media was covering the pogroms in Baku more enthusiastically. Radio stations Liberty and BBC were airing daily updates. On January 19, 1990, the New York Times published an article which said, Azerbaijan is not Lithuania. Nationalists in Azerbaijan also talk of independence, but their protest includes bloody pogroms against their Armenian neighbors. On July 27, 1990, in the same newspaper, an editorial presented an open letter to the international community, signed by nearly 150 renowned foreign scholars and human rights defenders, who named the Armenian pogroms in Baku racism, threatening the future of mankind. 
Seven years later, the events in Baku were reflected in a report presented at the 17th session of the UN Committee of Elimination of Discrimination Against Women on July 17 to 25, 1997, which said, For five days in January of 1990, the Armenian community of Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, were killed, tortured, robbed, and humiliated. Pregnant women and babies were molested. Little girls were raped in front of their parents' eyes. Christian crosses were burned on their backs, and they were abused for their Christian faith. On March 5th, a closed session of the USSR Supreme Council was held, where a number of top Soviet officials presented the horrifying details of the Baku massacre and spoke candidly of the tragedy. But those details never appeared in the press. Twenty years have passed since the pogroms in Baku and exodus of Armenians. All this time, the essence of the Black January of 1990 has been cynically warped. The traces of the policy to exterminate Armenians, in this case, the native population of Baku, are being deleted from history. This is the so-called Shahid Ali in contemporary Baku, where the pogrom makers, murderers, and rapists are buried. High-ranking guests arriving in Baku are obliged to visit the area and lay a wreath to the eternal flame. There are practically no Armenians left in Azerbaijan. Xenophobia and hatred towards Armenians have been made the state policy of Azerbaijan. In view of the whole world, Christian cemeteries and monuments are being demolished. All this is an alarm to the international community. It says that a stable and just peace in the South Caucasus is not possible until the organizers of perpetrators of the genocide of Armenians in Azerbaijan and in Nagorno-Karabakh in 1988-1992 are made responsible. This is what all those who advocate for Azerbaijan's claims on Nagorno-Karabakh should be aware of. They inflame Azerbaijan's appetite and spur its authorities to organize new acts of genocide in the region of the South Caucasus. Not a single crime committed by Azerbaijan against Armenians has ever received due legal or political assessment. Not a single criminal has ever been named or punished. The Nuremberg for Baku is still ahead.